This is the latest in our series of recordings from the Sheffield Treasures Project. Today we're looking at the story of Taylor's Eyewitness, one of Sheffield's famous companies. It's interesting to note that Taylor's Eyewitness is the brand that the company is known by, but actually, if we look at this second slide, we can see that there's some other names there. There's a number of thing, information on this slide. First of all, the company was founded in 1835. The image here is probably from post 1907 because we can look at the dates on some of the medals. We've got the mention of a number of works here. We've got the pyramid works. We've got the Ceylon works. Um, we've got the Milton works, more of those later. The other thing though, is what we've got at the bottom of the page, we've got this mention of Needham, Veal and Tysaac. Now Needham, Veal and Tysaac doesn't run off the tongue very easily, but that was actually the company that ran Taylor's Eyewitness. And we'll come to more of that later. The other thing we've got on the bottom is the mention of Milton Street and Milton Street, was significantly the base for this company for a long period of time. But again, um, we mentioned a number of other works while we're involved in this talk. If we look at the early beginnings, the company was formed in 1828 by John Taylor, small workshop St. Philip's Works, Brookhill, making pen, pocket and sportsman knives. In 1938, he was granted the mark, the Eye of Providence, the all-seeing eye, the eye of Horus, the eye from Taylor's Eyewitness. And as we've said in other talks, if you're a Sheffield cutlery manufacturer, it was a little bit of a challenge coming up with a new brand when there are already thousands of brands out there. The other thing that's interesting about this eye symbol, it's got some Masonic connections and certainly lots of Sheffield's cutlers were actually members of the Freemasons. In 1841, it's the first time the company is listed in directory. John Taylor died in 1854 at the age of 61. The business was acquired by a cutler and shopkeeper, also of St. Philip's Road. Thomas Needham married John Taylor's daughter. So here we've got this second name appearing, uh, Thomas Needham, and he had manufactured knives under his own name at the Exchange Works in Hedford Street in the 1860s. He died in 1870 and is buried in the General Cemetery, leaving £3,000. The business passed to James Veal, the second name in that uh, trio, who'd been an apprenticeship to H.G. Long, another prominent Sheffield cutler. And in 1870, he, they had a base at the Milton Works, but also a depot on Church Street. Now, one of the things is the company was quite famous for innovation and expansion, and they often uh, sort of boasted about the products. So one of the products was the Cunningham Painted Safety Carving Fork. And I suppose one of the things is just to think about, you know, going back 100 years, the Sunday roast was probably a king, uh, king bit of the diet. And, and uh, so having a good roasting set and a good carving fork uh, was an essential thing. They also painted Clark's horse clippers. Uh, Thomas's patent folding knife. So the fact they were taking out patents on products suggests that they, they were coming up with things that they thought were better than other people. Significant development in 1879, Walter Tysaac of the scythe making Abidel family joined the business and henceforth we've got that full brand now, Needham, Veal and Tysaac. Um, we've got a picture that you can see here of the of the carving set that was provided by the company and the veal carver fork serves a double purpose besides being a perfectly rigid guard there's a divided extension through the fork to the underparts forming a rest which protects the table linen from stain the rest being divided forms a spring so that when the guard is either up or down it'll always remain firm in position the arrangement is simple but unique and it's a distinct advance on the former styles. So again, we've got this innovation and many of you will have carving sets at home and you probably don't have that extra attachment that just goes on the bottom to keep you a tablecloth clean. And in fact, obviously in modern parlance, many people don't use tablecloths. The company continued to expand. And in 1887, the workforce was up to 200 and it became a limited company with a capital of 60,000 pounds. They purchased another company, Nixon and Winterbottom, whose brand was Pyramids. And the, pyra and the base of the Pyramid Works in Broom Hall and it formed into a limited company capitalised at £20,000. They were an attractive company to buy as they pioneered machine-made cutlery and Walter Tysaac was sensitive to German competition. You might be able to make it out, but on the photograph below, there's, there's a knife that was made by Winterbottom. And on it, it says Green River Knives. 
Now, I've come across this phrase green nip ribbon as before, but I didn't really know what it meant. And essentially, green river knives were made by John Russell um, in the States um, from 1836 onwards. And his factory was in Massachusetts on the Green River. So this was almost the, the passing of um, knives that had been made in Sheffield to America taking on um, making knives over there. And so Sheffield was almost um, taking the names from an American company to put on their knives. And of course, as settlers went west, they needed knives to, to open up the um, the Wild West. And uh, we got this knife a bit in the Bowie knife style with a fixed blade and with a wooden handle. But it's interesting how some of that terminology from the States have found its way back into um, a brand on, on a Sheffield knife. Well, this company had a range of products. Um, pen and pocket knives was something they'd made from the word go. And then they had over 2,000 knives in their range. So if you're going to buy a pen, tailor's eyewitness, a pen and pocket knife, you had lots and lots of choice. They also made table knives, butcher's knives, carvers, scissors, pruning shears, razors, hollow and plain, for which they were developing a worldwide reputation. One of the things that's not on that list that was... Uh, there from many other cutlery manufacturers was in fact that notion of hollowware and certainly silver plated goods and hollowware weren't a big part of this company in its early days. On the next slide you can actually see some of that range of 2,000 pen and pocket knives and we've got pages and pages in the catalogue of pen and pocket knives. You know, you've got artisans pocket knives, um, you know, you've got timber scribes on there, you've got scouts and sailors knives, uh, a range of handles, you've got the sort of marlin spike on there, um, you, you, you've got other attachments to, you've got a clip so you can put it on your belt, you've got sportsman's knives which increasingly had more and more attachments, they've got spikes on them, they've got corkscrews on them, um, all sorts of gadgets were actually placed on the end of Sheffield knives and that was one of the things that actually differentiated the products. One of the things we always like to do these talks, we, we essentially linking together some of the wonderful information we've got from Jeffrey Tweedale, but with things that are actually in the collection. On the left hand side there, you can see we've got some plumbers and pruning knives that are in the collection. Um, these knives probably well, over 100 years old, uh, pressed horn handles. Uh, in the middle slide, you can see a range of those table knives that we've actually got in the collection. When we started, we weren't sure, should we just collect one knife by a manufacturer or should we aspire to collect every knife that they were made? Well, we've got something now like two and a half thousand different table knives in the collection. And that's just, that's the, the knives we've got from Taylor's Eyewitness. And you can see that they're all shapes and sizes, um, different size blades, different sized handles, different materials, sheer steel, stainless steel. So quite a range. And then of course, there was also the a notion about marketing the product. And in the end there, you can see we've got a, a cutlery box with the eye on it. And one of the things about Sheffield knives, they're very, very durable, but the cutlery boxes, of course, were only made of cardboard. And actually, it's getting harder and harder to see the cutlery boxes in their sort of perfect condition. One of the other things that, again, they, they were innovating with table cutlery. Often, in it, when we have table cutlery, sometimes the tang can actually be seen through the handle. So one of the things that Taylor's eyewitness were trying to do was actually get rid of the tang. And they had this innovative method for just fastening uh, the blade to the handle actually without a tang and something that they thought was very, very strong. And it didn't leave a mark through the knife. One of the things about Taylor's eyewitness um, it's quite a clever brand, actually. It's got a few um, strands to it. You can see here a little advert, you know, and, and we've got there the, uh, the judge and, of course, that notion of an eyewitness in a trial. And they're just, they're just putting that into marking as something that's a bit of a joke. Um, they made butcher's knives and the butcher's knives would have been made from sheer steel. Uh, when stainless steel was invented, quite a lot of butchers, um, people still like sheer steel knives because they were actually better. And, you know, got wonderful names on these knives, the bully, the easy skinner. And if you were a butcher, you would have wanted these specific knives for a specific function. Interesting that they also had this notion of innovating with knives. We've got a tomato knife there, which actually doesn't look like some of the other tomato knives we've got in the, in the collection. We've got cheese knives, we've got bread knives, we've got hunting knives. Um, just going back to that Wild West theme for a bit, we've got this notion of sheaf knives. And 
On these knives, it's interesting just reading down the list of labels on them. Bushman's knives, Green River knives, Queensland knife, Bushman's friend, Northwest knife. Re this real sense of adventure in different parts of the world, in Canada, in Australia. And if you were going to open up that virgin territory, you needed a, a knife that was going to be all purpose and doing all things. And of course, Sheffield would provide them for you. And there was a sense of when the Sheffield had difficulty selling things in the American market, they actually moved across and they, they, they developed the, um, the, the market in New Zealand and in Australia. Carvers and gadgets. So we've already mentioned something about the um, the, the, the wonderful uh, carving forks. But it was interesting if you bought the big set, which you can see at the top of the left hand diagram, not only did you get a meat carver, but you also got a set of game carvers. Uh, and in the package, you got a two wheel knife sharpener in the middle there. Um, you actually had breakfast carvers. I'm not really sure what people were having for breakfast um, for you to actually need a carving set. Uh, maybe it was people who were having game for breakfast or maybe people were having ham for breakfast. So that was something that was really quite interesting. On the right hand side of the picture, we can see a, a number of innovations again. So we've got a scraper for painters, but actually we've got a guard there to prevent people burning their hands. Uh, we've got um a slicing meat and chopping knife, which looks uh, quite, quite, quite significant. And then also um, we've got, again, this quite clever play on words, the hygienic butcher's knife. And, and then at the bottom, we've got the pep cork lifter pen knife, which could be branded with donors adverts. So that, that was another factor that went on in the, in, in the Sheffield uh, pocket knife scenario. The next slide shows rather unusual object, which I purchased originally as a, as a herb cutter. Didn't really know what it was. And I think, I don't know whether it was I was doing the preparation for this talk, but I came across the, the following slide, which actually shows vegetable and grapefruit knives. And down at the bottom there, we've got the notion of a paper cut, a potato knife. Now, the potato knife... Um, OK, it's great to identify the object, but then just thinking, how would you use a potato knife? Was it something for using in the kitchen or was it for something using in a field when you were actually picking potatoes? Well, somebody when I posted this on social media, somebody very kindly uh, showed me the, the detail and, and the big reveal that actually this knife was for making bubble and squeak. In 10 years of sort of researching Sheffield cutlery and buying a lot of Sheffield cutlery, I've never ever seen another knife like this. But we, we've got this explanation here. The process of making bubble and squeak replied as much scraping as it did frying. A specialist tool called a bubble and squeak scraper was once used for making the job easier. However, the true purpose of these beautifully designed utensils has now been entirely forgotten. As well as having a sharp edge for scraping the crunchy bits that stuck to the pan, they also allowed you to chop the vegetables as they fried. The craftily designed handle enabled you to use them without being obstructed on the sides of the pan. So, um, again, interesting that, that insight into um, Victorian dining. And I, you, I wonder if there were cafes that sold bubble and squeak. Latterly, Needham, Veal and Tysaac did get into silver plated goods that registered two silver marks in 1890 and 1892. Top left there, um, you can see implements for sardine, uh, serving sardines. We've got bread forks, we've got pickle forks. Um, anybody listening to this, if you haven't got a pickle fork in the house, I would just say you need a pickle fork. Such a, uh, a well-designed Victorian item that did the job rather than putting your fingers in the jars. The bread forks are more unusual and have only ever once come across anybody who ever knew anybody else who'd actually used a bread fork but again it was part of that notion that the victorians didn't want to touch the food so they would pass meat or they would pass bread another aspect of course cutlery is something that cuts and so one of the other things that this company was famous for was making scissors so in this particular catalogue which is a green catalogue and it's loose leaf there are 172 different pairs of scissors there's scissors for buttonholes um, we know you got grape scissors for going on the dining table but they got vine scissors um, for actually cutting the grapes while they were still there in the greenhouse I had the privilege of going to the Taylor's Eyewitness factory and in that factory they've got a showroom and this slide below is a dis well is a display case that's on the wall of the factory and this is for the great exhibition in 1851 and uh, I haven't counted how many pairs of scissors there are but you can see that that's a sort of magnificent Sheffield treasure um, that is still if you like in Sheffield and it's really great to see. 
Another thing that Taylor's eyewitness were really famous for was their razors. It's interesting, um, the only bit of colour in the whole catalogue is this uh, box of the Thousand Razor, which was their particularly strong brand. Um, and so I think it just goes to show how important that was to them in their product range. Um, it's interesting, it says the edge of a fine razor being one three thousandths of an inch and it suggests the thumb should not be drawn across it. I don't know if that's for health and safety reasons. I don't think it means because you're going to damage the razor. Um, you could buy sets of seven day razors. It also suggests there that the, the leather strop is something that should only be used on a specialist basis by a barber who was actually trained to do that. And so um, we had this notion that not only did the box say the thousand razor, but also on the razor itself, it was engraved with the thousand razor. You got square end razors, you got curved end razors. Um, actually, later on, they came up with a product that was the two thousand razor. Underneath there, you've got a couple more adverts. And it's interesting, the, the, the facsimile is of, of there of, of the stone that they actually use to uh, grind the, and sharpen the razor on. And whereas in Sheffield, we're very used to having seen pictures of uh, cutlers standing over big, quite big millstones. Um, there you've got a picture on the left of actually uh, somebody working on just a very small stone. Um, it almost looks like he's sitting on a bath, um, but you've got a small stone there, uh, but the exact size of the stone. And it also says there another works gets mentioned here, the Glamorgan Works, which was the place where Joseph Haywood, um, whose logo was a kettle, had worked. But basically Needham, Veal and Tysak, they bought them out for £660. But interesting, the pocket knife side of that business went to uh, went to. Thomas Turner. We've talked about brands before and in an earlier talk about Joseph Elliott we talk about that company owning uh, lots and lots of different brands. Well here we've got a range of trademarks from Needham, Veal and Tysak and a combination of those trademarks being things that reflected the product so the eye and we've got the thousand in there as a brand. We've also got other things in there like the llama it's a South American market it was very important to Sheffield cutlery industry and there's a bugle there now that was something that was owned by another company Hunters that was acquired in 1910. So one of the things that happened in Sheffield and increasingly as the number of companies reduced as we went further through the uh, further through the 1900s was that companies acquired a number of different brands. So at the end of the day Needham, Beale and Tysak owned a significant number of different brands. Just going back to a little bit the history of the company. Um, so uh, James Veal died at the Elms a Collegiate Crescent in Sheffield, left £17,000, which in today's money is equivalent of £1.5 million. Uh, Needham, Veal and Tyres at one of the first adopters of stainless steel in 1915. They'd all, again, with, you know, remember, they'd always been innovative. 1980, there was falling demand for pocket knives and razors. Walter Tyzak, who who'd been quite innovative, he led an amalgamation of a number of Sheffield cutlery companies and formed the Sheffield Cutlery Manufacturing Limited, which include Joseph Elliott, Lockwood Brothers, Nixon and Winterbottom, Southern and Richardson, Thomas Turner, all big significant names. Sadly, in 1822, Walter had a stroke and he retired to London and died in 1925. Bad management, poor trading and brand rivalry ruined the merger. Needham, Veal and Tysak took over Southern and Richardson, the company survived the interwar period and prospered post-war. It acquired other companies and brand, Sainer, Cook and Rydell in 1948, Heatley Brothers, Parkin and Marshall, Horcroft and Brooks Bank. 1965, the firm was styled as Taylor's Eyewitness. In 1974, they were absorbed by Harrison Fisher & Co, who eventually renamed the company Taylor's Eyewitness. Now, it's interesting um, Harrison Fisher took over Taylor's Eyewitness. When I started thinking, what company shall I research? I was thinking, shall I do Harrison Fisher or shall I do Taylor's Eyewitness? And I didn't realise that the two of those companies had actually come together. So Harrison Fisher was set up at a later date in 1896. Now they specialised in plated goods and table knives at the Trafalgar Works in Sheffield. One of the things I've realised in the dealing with a lot of Sheffield cutlery is Harrison Fisher were one of the biggest makers of silver plated goods and goods with mother of pearl handles, the sort of fancy goods market. And I just, you know, I almost feel like their output was greater than many other, other companies in that period. In 1903, Harrison Fisher, Harrison Fisher died aged 36 
and the business continued with a partner, Samuel Morton, who Samuel Lawton, who'd been a director at RF Mosley, again one of the first companies to exploit stainless steel knives. In 1946, the electroplate and pewter side of the business was sold to Culfin K. Acquired a number of other brands, including John Sanderson's and Sons. Um, it had been a friendly takeover of Taylor's Eyewitness, and the Trafalgar Works was sold to the City Council, and his, uh, the Taylor's Milton Works expanded to house both companies. Next slide just shows some of that marketing that you would have got from the companies. It's interesting, did the company provide these display stands to department stores to make sure that their products um, would be things that would be at would be picked up. Um, clearly, if you're a department store, you couldn't have had too many of these different display cases. So I guess there was competition between Sheffield companies to try and see what you were going to get located um, in, in the different shops. The great thing about this company, of course, it's still going today. And the company has moved to new premises on the east side of Sheffield. It's still operating with a very extensive catalogue uh, that runs to hundreds of pages. They make over 20,000 knives a week in Sheffield. And they're an agent for other famous like Sabatier. The biggest customer is actually TK Maxx, which is actually a worldwide company. They don't sell um, direct to the public, but the Sheffield shop in Sheffield uh, actually sells their things. And you can also find lots and lots of different Taylor's Eyewitness items if you look on um, online uh, platforms like eBay. It's great to say they are still making uh, limited edition pocket knives um, and you've got an example there of some Barlow knives that, that, that they're making which of course the tradition of Barlow knives goes back to the west side of Sheffield, um, the area known as Stannington and there's a long long history of Barlow knives both in Sheffield and obviously they were latterly made in the States. Um, the next slide just shows some of their modern knives that are actually made for the kitchen. And on the right hand side there, we've got lots of multicolored objects, uh, which would grace the modern kitchen. And one of the ways in which the company has moved with the time is actually keeping up with demand for lots and lots of uh, kitchen items and kitchen gadgets. And when I was in their showroom, it actually felt like I was in a big retail shop um, selling lots of items. Uh, it's great to see as well, uh, they're making scissors, um, scissors from the old style, scissors from the new style. So that's something that's particularly attractive. I had the great pleasure of visiting the showroom and as well as the modern items in the showroom, they've also got a few things there um, which highlight the company from the past. And, you know, we've got a lovely case here of a novelty pocket knives that were made for commemorative occasions or were made to catch a particular market. Um, you can see the slide after shows uh, lots of pocket knives in the shape of a fish or in the shape of a foot, which were again very popular in Victorian times. Some of the fish shaped knives probably were for fishermen, but also they were just something that people could use as a novelty. So it was wonderful to see there. We have this wonderful um, letter from the Queen of England, Queen, um, to basically, Queen, and it was Queen Mary, um, and this was a company, Brooks Bank, which was one of the companies that had been taken over by tailors, and they'd made a miniature knife for the Queen's doll's house, and, you know, the Queen's there saying, it's with the greatest pleasure that I say thank you, and um, this was something that went in the British Empire exhibition uh, to raise money for charity. We've mentioned the Great Exhibition a few times, and again, one of the nice things that the company's got, it's actually got some medals um, from the Great Exhibition, and these were two medals from 1851. The only other time I've seen medals in Sheffield uh, are with the Norfolk knife in the Cutler's Hall, so it's nice to, to see a few more of these great Sheffield's artefacts. And, you know, Sheffield did rule the world in 1851 in terms of the manufacturing cutlery, and it's still great that, you know, Taylor's Eyewitness as a company is still actually going and is still in business. Well, I'd just like to make a few acknowledgements for this um, this talk. One is I'd like to thank Alistair Fisher uh, for sh one of the original members of the Harris, you know, Harrison Fisher family uh, for, for showing me around the factory and for showing me the showrooms and, and giving me some of the information. Lots of the information for our talks comes from Geoffrey Tweedale, um, who has shared um, his history of companies with us. And obviously Ken Hawley, who was the ultimate collector and the inspiration for the this project actually comes from Ken.
If you want to know more um, about the Hawley Collection, you've got some links there below. Um, our Name on a Knife Blade website, where you can almost look up any knife maker and see the history of them, uh, populated with information from Jeffrey Tweedell. That's now had over 300,000 hits. And these talks will go on YouTube. And you're looking at this, and obviously there's a range of other talks, and that's had nearly 400,000 hits. So that's a really useful place to have a look. And of course, we'd welcome you to visit us if you come in any day between a Tuesday and a Friday, there will be volunteers and they can show you elements of the collection. And please get in touch if you can add to our knowledge or you'd like to uh, help us with some research. Thank you.